In the legendary land of Lilliput, there was a lake. The lake was very bountiful, and yielded great amounts of fish that the Lilliputians enjoyed dining on. Many fishermen came to work on the lake, but eventually, as the number of fishermen increased and demand for the fish rose, the stock of fish in the lake began to shrink as fewer and fewer fish were being left to repopulate the lake after every season. But the shrinking supply of fish didn't shrink the demand for them, and the price of the fish rose, which further increased pressure to take yet more fish from the lake. This is Frank the fisherman. He knows that if he and the rest of his fellow fishermen continue to take fish from the lake at the rate they currently are, they will end up killing off their own source of wealth and possibly drive the fish to extinction. Frank values the income he gathers from the lake, and he also enjoys eating the fish that can be taken from the lake, and doesn't want to witness the sad day when these fish die off. If he had to, he would even quit his job and stop fishing in order to prevent them from going extinct. The problem is, he knows that quitting his job wouldn't stop the extinction of the fish. Frank knows that if he didn't take fish out of the lake, the other fishermen would just take what he left and the fish would still die off just as fast. He thinks for a moment that maybe he could fix the problem by increasing the number of fish in the lake by paying for fish farms to raise more fish and restocking the lake. But he soon realizes that this would be infeasible because the rest of the fishermen wouldn't be contributing to this effort, but they would be able to increase their catch anyhow, and so they, his competitors, would be reaping the benefits of his action while he bears all the costs, and he knows that he wouldn't be able to continue to stay in business by allowing for this to happen. Frank considers asking the Lilliputian government to step in and limit the number of fishermen and the amount they can catch every year. But Frank is pretty smart, so he realizes that the fishermen would still have the incentive to push for an increase in the amount they can catch, and that the politicians who have the power to increase that amount wouldn't have the knowledge nor the incentive to deny the fishermen constituents what they want. His suspicions of this are heightened due to the recurrent failures of government to properly protect public resources like this in the past. This problem plagues the Lilliput Lake until one day a man from a far distant land comes to pay the Lilliputians a visit. Dr. Gulliver has seen such problems in other parts of the world during his travels and knows of a people who have figured out a way to resolve this matter. Dr. Gulliver explains that the root of the problem is that the resources held publicly rather than privately. This problem isn't limited to fish, but also occurs when it comes to publicly held grazing land, logging forests, and all other valuable and limited resources that are available to multiple competing consumers. When a valuable resource is instead held privately, it behooves the owner to protect the value the resource provides by making sure not to overextract an otherwise self-replenishing resource or by cultivating the resource to maximize its production. This works even for non-renewable resources such as copper and gold. When a resource is in small demand but high supply, an owner of that resource will benefit the most by selling large amounts of the, the resources at low prices. This is also the best thing for the consumer who wants cheap products. But if the supply relative to demand shrinks, the resource owners will send less and charge higher prices, and they will do so even more if they predict that that supply will continue to decline relative to demand, since they know they'll be able to charge even more in the future. This is exactly what we want them to do, since this will guide consumers to use less of the resource by recycling more often, being more efficient with its use, or by finding more plentiful substitutes for it. Dr. Culliver explains that one of the lands that he has visited in his travels has devised a means of forming private property rights over the fish that would allow each fisherman to have a share of ownership over the resource. That society took the historic average amount of fish that each fisherman caught as a percentage of the total amount of fish extracted and gave each fisherman that amount of shares in a newly formed corporation that had exclusive ownership of the fishing rights within that nation's waters. The fishermen who then had ownership rights to the entire fish stock would come together and vote on the amount of fish that they would agree to catch next year. Each fisherman was then allowed to catch the percent of that total that they owned in shares of the corporation. The fishermen immediately voted to drastically reduce the number of fish they would catch next year. Now that the fishermen were allowed to privately own the fishing rights themselves rather than just what they could catch today, it suddenly became worthwhile for them to reduce the amount they caught today and allow the stocks to replenish themselves. This was not only due to the fact that it would allow them to catch more 
in the future, it was also because the fishermen could sell their shares in the ownership of this resource. And, the, and those shares became much more valuable if the resource was allowed to grow and become more productive. For these reasons, it is important to the goal of minimizing the waste and abuse of society's scarce resources that the scope of private property rights be expanded as far as possible while minimizing the role of public property.